good morning. I trust you all had a good night's rest. It's a beautiful day today. Of course, every day when we're alive and breathing is a beautiful day. Uh, but uh, we're reaching the final stretch of our seminar. And this morning we are going to uh, study beginning on page 329 of our syllabus. The title is Some Amazing Details Confirmed. And we're going to take several examples of how Ellen White uh, is a great help in defining and explaining certain things from Scripture. But before we do, we want to have a word of prayer. We always want to begin the day with a word of prayer. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here. We thank you for the gift of prophecy as it's been manifested in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. What a tremendous blessing. I ask, Lord, that as we study, not only in this first session, but in the course of this day, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts and to open our hearts, because uh, we don't want these things to be merely academic. We want the message to impact our own personal lives so that we can influence others to follow Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of prayer and for hearing us, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, let's take a few moments to examine some statements from Ellen White where she does not add to the Scriptures, but rather helps us clarify certain concepts. The first example, I'm going to give you several examples. The first example that we're going to take a look at is the end of Judas. Now, when you read the Gospels and the account in the book of Acts, there appears to be a contradiction between how the Gospels describe the end of Judas and how the book of Acts describes it. We're going to find that Ellen White reconciles both very beautifully. I want to read, first of all, Matthew 27 and verse 5, where we find the description of how Judas died. Of course, we know he committed suicide. It says there in Matthew 27, verse 5, Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and went and hanged himself. So clearly the gospel tells us that Judas went and hanged himself. He committed suicide. But in Acts chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, we have a different explanation. I want you to notice what we find there. And here Peter is speaking uh, on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. And then comes a parenthetical statement about his end. It says, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. <laughs> uh, how, do, how do you reconcile Judas falling and his belly busting open and his entrails gushing out with the idea in the Gospels that Judas hanged himself? Well, listen to this beautiful reconciliation of the two statements by the Spirit of Prophecy. This is found in Volume 3 of Spirit of Prophecy, page 148. They hurried away, they hurried Jesus away with loud shouts of triumph. But their noise ceased for a time when they passed a retired place. That's the crowd that's following Jesus to the place of the crucifixion. And saw at the foot of a, of a lifeless tree the dead body of Judas, who had betrayed Christ. It was a most revolting spectacle. His weight had broken the cord by which he had hung himself to the tree. And in falling, his body had become horribly mangled and was then being devoured by dogs. The mutilated remains were ordered to be buried at once, and the crowd passed on. But there was less noisy mockery, and many a pale face revealed the fearful thoughts within. 
retribution seemed already to be visiting those who were guilty of the blood of Jesus. Interesting description, isn't it? So are both accounts true? Of course they are. Now, for the superficial reader, uh, the, the person would say, hey, you have a contradiction in the Bible because the account in the Gospels and the account of, in the book of Acts are totally different. The Gospels say he hanged himself and Acts says that he fell from a, a height and, uh, you know, his belly busted open and his entrails came out. But Ellen White is a great help in explaining how these two accounts are both reliable from Scripture. Now, the next point I already mentioned in a previous uh, presentation, but I did not provide the evidence, so I'm going to take the time to do this. When did God sanctify the Sabbath? It is commonly thought, and I thought for many years, that Adam and Eve were commanded to keep the first Sabbath of creation week. Ellen White begs to differ. In every statement she makes it clear that the Sabbath was sanctified when the day ended after God rested the entire day. In other words, the day was made holy by God's rest. Adam and Eve could not have kept the Sabbath holy before it was made holy. They could not have followed God's example before God gave the example. And they could not keep the fourth commandment until they had worked six because the Bible says work six and rest the seventh. And Adam and Eve had not worked six. See, it makes perfect sense. And when you read Genesis verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 in Exodus 20, the fourth commandment, it becomes very clear that God sanctified and blessed the Sabbath when the day ended. Now, the biblical testimony is clear. Let's notice the biblical text and then Ellen White's explanation and amplification. Genesis 2 verse 3 says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Why did God bless and sanctify the day? Because in it He what? Rested. That's past tense, right? Because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. So you have cause and effect. He sanctified the Sabbath because He had rested upon the Sabbath. So He rests and then He sanctifies the day. It's just as clear in the fourth commandment. Exodus 20 verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, period. Therefore, what does therefore indicate? Because he did this, now he's going to do this. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. When did God bless the Sabbath day and hallow it? After he rested the entire day. It's God's rest that makes the Sabbath holy. And after God makes it holy, he gives the Sabbath to man. Are you clear on that point? Let's read some statements from Ellen White. She never makes a mistake of saying, you know, God told Adam and Eve to keep the first Sabbath because it was holy. No, it was made holy by God's rest. And then, along with the first six days, God gave the entire week to Adam and Eve. He had to create the week before He gave the week to them. Is that clear? Now, notice the statements from Ellen White. After resting upon the seventh day... Now, what part of after don't you understand? After resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it or set it apart as a day of rest for man. When did the Sabbath become a day of rest for man? After. When it ended. God created it first. The Sabbath was made for man. God had to make it before He gave it to man. Now, notice Desire of Ages 281. Because He had rested upon the Sabbath... Because he what? Had rested. had rested upon the Sabbath. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Set it apart to a holy use. He gave it to Adam. When did he give it to Adam? Because he had rested. Now he sanctifies it and then he gives it to Adam as a day of rest. So when did the, did the Sabbath become a day of rest for Adam? After the Sabbath ended. Because each second that God rested, that second became holy. Every minute God rested, that minute became holy. And every hour that God rested, that hour became holy. And when God had rested the last second, the whole day was holy. 
That's why Sunday can't be a day of rest because no one rested. God did not rest on Sunday. He did not set aside Sunday as a day of rest because He did not rest on it. Now, Ellen White continues saying, It was a memorial of the work of creation and thus a sign of God's power and His what? And His love. Here's another one, My Life Today, page 259. She's referring to the day in Revelation 1 verse 10 where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, which most Christian churches say, well, that was Sunday that he received this vision. But notice what Ellen White explains. The Lord's Day mentioned by John was the Sabbath, the day on which Jehovah rested after the wor great work of creation and which He blessed and sanctified because He had rested upon it. See, she doesn't make the mistake that so many theologians make. That, oh, you, you know, God, Adventist theologians, God told Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. Listen, God couldn't tell Adam and Eve to keep the first Sabbath before it was made holy. And incidentally, enemies of the Adventist church like Del Retzlaff, who sends out this magazine proclamation trashing everything Adventist, he says, the Sabbath is not a creation institution because in Genesis it doesn't say that God told man to rest. But now we know why it doesn't say that man should rest on that first Sabbath. But the fourth commandment says that after man worked six days, the next Sabbath he was going to rest. Are you with me or not? The Bible is clear on that point. So this is a very important theological point. This is not an insignificant thing because because the enemies of the Adventist church, they always say that the Sabbath first appears in Exodus. And therefore, it's, it's Jewish. It is not a creation ordinance. But now we know why God didn't command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. It's because that first Sabbath is the Lord's Sabbath. He rested. And after He made it holy, He gave it to man. Here's another one. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 247. God blessed and sanctified the seventh day because He rested upon it from all His wondrous work of creation. Here's another one, Patriarchs and Prophets 111. Now Ellen White never makes the theological mistake. How'd she know? She only had two and a half years of, of education, of primary education. She had no PhD. So how could she get it right? <laughs> because she was inspired, folks. Amen. <laughs> now notice, Patriarchs and Prophets 111. The first six days of each week are given to man for labor because God employed the same period of the first week in the work of creation. On the seventh day, listen carefully now, man is to refrain from labor in commemoration of the Creator's rest. Wow. <laughs> are you getting it? Not of His rest, the Creator's rest. So what was important on that first Sabbath? Was it man's rest or was it the Creator's rest? It was the Creator's rest. Great Controversy 453. Hallowed by the Creator's rest. Do you know what hallowed means? It means made holy. How was it made holy? By the Creator's rest. That's why it can't be holy until God had rested on the day. Hallowed by the Creator's rest and blessing, the Sabbath was kept by Adam in his innocence in Holy Eden. Do you notice that Adam kept the Sabbath after it, been, and it had been hallowed and blessed? Did you notice that in that quotation? Notice Review and Herald, September 16, 1862. Instead of keeping God's own rest day, she's talking about Sunday keepers, which he sanctified after he had rested upon it and set it apart for man to observe in reverence. So when did God set it apart for man in reverence? After, after he had rested. She says they honor a papal institution. So the question is, was Ellen White in harmony with Scripture when she stated that the Sabbath was sanctified when it ended? She makes absolutely explicit what you find in Genesis 2, verse 3, and what you find in Exodus 20 and verse 11. And she never makes the mistake 
You know, she was a staunch supporter of the Sabbath. It would have been very easy for Ellen White to say, yeah, and God told Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath. It would have been very easy. But Ellen White doesn't make that mistake because she knew that that was not the case. She was inspired by God. Now let's talk about Jesus changing his garments. I was once talking with an individual, uh, and this individual was an Adventist, and he was saying, you know, where in the world do you ever find in the Bible that Jesus is going to change his garments before he returns to this earth? He said, that must be something that Ellen White uh, came up with, but we can't find that in the Bible. And he was being somewhat sarcastic, so I looked at him and I said, you know what? If you used a little bit of the gray matter that God put in your brain, you would be able to figure out that it is in the Bible. Of course, he, he didn't like the way that I expressed it, and probably I shouldn't have expressed it that way, but, you know, unfortunately in this sinful world, sometimes sarcasm is answered with sarcasm. <laughs> Does the Bible corroborate what Ellen White says? Notice Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. What is the function of Jesus now in the heavenly sanctuary? What is his function? He's a high priest. Let's read it. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Does this passage clearly tell us that Jesus is now serving as our high priest? Yes. yes. Now here's the question. When Jesus returns to this earth, how is he going to be clothed? He's going to be clothed as a king. Notice Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So notice he's coming. This is the battle of Armageddon. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were what? Many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So how is Jesus clothed when he returns to this earth at his second coming? He comes robed as King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, let's use our head a little bit. If Jesus now is serving as a high priest, how is he clothed? He's clothed as a high priest. Now, if he is going to come clothed as a king before he comes, he must have changed. Right? So is what Ellen White says preposterous? No, it's biblical. If you just use the logical mind that God has given you. Now, let me read you Ellen White's statement. Early Writings, page 281. Then I saw Jesus lay off his priestly attire and clothe himself with his most kingly robes. Upon his head were many crowns. That's what Revelation says, right? Upon his head were many crowns, a crown within a crown, surrounded by the angelic host. He left heaven. The plagues were falling upon the inhabitants, uh, inhabitants of the earth. Some were denouncing God and cursing Him. Others rushed to the people of God and begged to be taught how they might escape His judgments. But the saints had nothing for them. The last tear for sinners had been shed. The last agonizing prayer offered. The last burden borne. The last warning given. And then that, that's found in early writings 281. In Christian Experience and Teaching, page 100, she expresses it a little differently. She doesn't say that, God, that Jesus puts on his garments as a king. She says that he puts on his garments of vengeance Those are the, because he's coming as king of kings and lord of lords. She says the nations are now getting angry, 
But when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, notice, when, when our high priest has finished his work in the sanctuary, he will stand up and what? Put on the garments of vengeance, and then the seven last plagues will be poured out. So once again, Ellen White, in harmony with Scripture. Now let's take another example. Time no longer. You know, Revelation chapter 10 is describing the Millerite movement, right? Yes. It's describing the time when, uh, you know, they devoured the little book, and the little book was sweet in the mouth. By the way, this little book is not the entire book of Daniel. We're going to notice that. This little book is actually the portion of Daniel that has to do with the 2300 days. It is Daniel 8 through 12 that, has, that the central theme is the 2300 day prophecy. That is what this little book is. And so, you know, they eat this, um, they eat this book and it's sweet in the mouth, but it becomes bitter in the aftermath. In other words, the message of judgment was going to have a sweet aspect to it, but then the aftermath was going to be bitter. And we know that this represents the Millerite movement. They were expecting the second coming of Christ. That was, Ellen White said it was the happiest day of, of her uh, whole life. And, uh, they, you know, they were in anticipation until midnight. They had uh, the beginning of the day wrong, and Jesus didn't come. And so the aftermath was very, very bitter. Now, in the context of this experience, this little book experience, remember the little book is the time element of the 2300-day prophecy, the angel makes a very interesting declaration, and I'm reading from the King James Version because most other modern versions do not translate it like the King James does. And the King James is right here. <clears throat> Revelation 10, verse 6, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. So when the 2300 day prophecy comes to an end, when the judgment hour message has come to its end in the Millerite movement, a declaration is made by the angel that time will be no longer. Now Ellen White remarks about the expression that there should be t time no longer the following. This time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which would precede the advent of our Lord. You notice she, she says, this is not the end of this world's history, it's not the end of time, it's not the close of probation, it's the end of the prophetic periods, is what she's saying. She continues stating, that is, the people would not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, which is the period when they were proclaiming the hour of judgment will come, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. Ellen White is clear. Scholars have struggled with the expression that there should be time no longer. Albert Barnes lists several scholars, each with his own interpretation of what the phrase means. Two of our ablest Revelation scholars, John Pauline and Ranko Stefanovich, contrary to what Ellen White says, believe that the expression should be translated that there would no longer be any delay. One thing is clear, the time referred to in this verse cannot mean the end of human history for at least two reasons. It cannot be the end of human history. Ellen White was right on that. You say, why can't it be, why when it says time will be no longer, it means that the end of the world has come. Why can't we believe that that's what it's talking about? For two reasons. Number one, this announcement that time would be no longer is made during the period of the sixth trumpet. But Jesus does not take over His kingdom until the seventh trumpet. 
So it cannot be the end of the world. Are you with me or not? Secondly, and this is a very important point, after the announcement was made, by the way, this shows that it's before the close of probation, what I'm going to share now. After the announcement was made that time will be no longer, John was instructed to prophesy again. How could he do this if the world had come to an end? And if probation had come to an end? The end of time referred to in this verse is not the end of the world, but rather the end of the prophetic time periods. Once again the word time is employed to describe the events on God's prophetic calendar. Are you understanding the two reasons? Yeah. Why this is speaking about the, the end of time before probation closes. It must refer to 1844. Time will be no longer because that is the longest prophetic time period. Now it's interesting that even some of our scholars and probably most of our scholars believe that it should be translated that there would no longer be any delay. There is a problem with this. It's not even scholarly. The translation, there should no longer be any delay, is incorrect. In the book of Revelation, the word chronos, which is the word that is used there for time, where we get the word chronology from, is used three other times, and in none of these can the word be translated in such a way. It's used in three other times in Revelation, and in those verses it's translated time. So why suddenly do you translate it delay here? Furthermore, in fact this word time is used in over 30 places in the New Testament, and it is not translated delay by modern versions except in this one verse. The New Testament had a way of expressing a delay, and it is the word chronizo, that is, and that word is used in Matthew 24, 48, where the servant says, My master is delayed. So there was a Greek word. So it's an enigma to me why this would be translated, even by your own scholars, there will no longer be any delay. What it does is it totally disconnects this verse from the experience of the Millerite movement. Are you with me or not? The translation delay obscures the link between Revelation 10 verse 6 and Daniel 10 and 12. C. Mervyn Maxwell, uh, who passed away a few years ago, he was my teacher at the seminary, uh, he taught uh, the denominational history class, had this to say, in Daniel 12, the man swore that the book would be closed until the time of the end, that is, until the time when the 1260 days and the 2300 days would come to an end. In Revelation 10, the angel holds the book open and swears that time, that is prophetic time, has come to an end. You see the relationship between Daniel and Revelation there? Yes. Once you translate delay in Revelation chapter 10, it disconnects it from Daniel. And Daniel and Revelation are to be studied together according to the spirit of prophecy. Now let's continue. In Daniel 12 verse 4 we are told that the little book was sealed until the time of the end. And then he sees a man clothed in linen who raises his hand to swear by the Creator that the book will remain sealed for three and a half times and then all will be fulfilled. Notice that the book is open first, then seven thunders utter their voices, then the angel declares that time will be no longer. Thus there is a difference between the opening of the little book in 1798 and the declaration that time will be no longer, which happens after the book is opened in 1844. Then when the message from the book is finished, the mystery of God comes to an end and probation closes. It is obvious that the declaration, time will be no longer, cannot have been made by the angel before the 42 months, the 1260 days, the three and a half times, the three and a half days, and the 2300 days would be fulfilled. Because uh, if uh, the angel said time will be no longer, and any of those prophecies had not yet been fulfilled, then it would not be true that time will be no longer. Are you following me or not? Now let's talk about something else. The identity of the little book the little book of Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Let's read that verse. 
But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. What is this verse really saying when it says that knowledge shall be increased? Is it talking about uh, a great increase in transportation, a uh, great increase in modern technology, computers, and iPhones, and electric toothbrushes, and things? <laughs> is it talking about things like that? Absolutely not. What the verse is saying is, Daniel, seal the little book and close it. So can people understand it? No. Close the book and it's going to remain closed until a certain point. Until the time of the end. But what's going to happen at the time of the end? At the time of the end, many are going to run to and fro and knowledge of the book will be increased. Of the little book. Are you with me or not? Incidentally, the same idiom is used in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, where it says that many will run to and fro, they'll go to the north and to the east, uh, seeking the word of God, and they shall not be able to find it. So running to and fro doesn't mean, you know, they're getting on trains and on airplanes and in automobiles and race cars and all these things. No, no, no. It's not talking about movement in that way. It's talking actually about a people running to and fro, seeking for the meaning of what is found in this little book. Is that true of the Millerite movement after 1798? Oh, you better believe it. And, and let me ask you, the book of Daniel, can many parts of the book of Daniel be understood? Can Daniel 2 be understood? Could it be understood before 1844? Could Daniel 7 be understood before 1844? Could Daniel 4 and Daniel 3 and Daniel 2 and Daniel uh, 1, could all those be understood before the time of the end? Absolutely. In fact, Hippolytus in the third century of the Christian era interpreted Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 exactly like we do. So the portion of Daniel that is sealed is the portion that has to do with the 2300 day prophecy. And uh, you know I have an entire presentation on that particular point that we can't go into right now. So let's notice what Ellen White had to say about this little book. Did, did, under, did Ellen White understand that the little book was not all of Daniel, but it was really a portion of Daniel? The portion that had to do with the 2300 day prophecy? Of course she did. You know, many scholars say that Daniel is the little book. Ellen White didn't make that mistake. She always said it's a portion of Daniel. Let's read those statements. Acts of the Apostles, page 585. In the Revelation, all the books of the Bible meet and end. Here is the complement of the book of Daniel. One is a prophecy, the other a revelation. The book that was sealed is not the revelation, but that portion. Now what part of portion don't you understand? But that portion of the prophecy of Daniel relating to the last days. The angel commanded, and now she's going to say, this is the little book of Daniel 12, verse 4. The angel commanded, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Are you seeing what Ellen White is saying? Now, notice Great Controversy 355. The message of salvation has been preached in all ages. But this message, she's referring to the first angel's message, is a part of the gospel which could be proclaimed only in the last days, for only then would it be true that the hour of judgment had come. Could Paul preach the hour of his judgment had come? Did Luther preach the hour of his judgment has come? They couldn't preach that because the judgment hadn't come. So this is a message that could only be preached at the end of time. She continues saying, the prophecies present a succession of events, like Daniel 2, lion, bear, leopard, dragon, ten horns, little horn, succession of events. That's historicism. The prophecies present a succession of events leading down to the opening of the what? Judgment. Daniel 7, what do you have after the, the line of prophecy? You have Jesus, uh, the Father moving, and then Jesus coming on the clouds for the judgment. 
And in Daniel chapter 8, the culmination is the 2300 day prophecy, the judgment. See, she's in harmony with Scripture. She continues saying, this is especially true of the book of Daniel. But that part of his prophecy which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Is the entire book of Daniel sealed to the time of the end? No. How did, the, how did Ellen White, with two and a half years of primary education, understand this? Without any PhD, she got the point. How? Because she was inspired. She continues saying, but that part of his prophecy which related to the last days, Daniel was bidden to close up and seal to the time of the end. Now notice, not till we reach this time could a message concerning the judgment be proclaimed based on the fulfillment of these prophecies. But, now she's going to explain Daniel 12 verse 4, but at the time of the end, says the prophet, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. How is she using this uh, phrase, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. What is it that's going to be increased? The knowledge of the little book of the judgment aspect. Here's another quotation, Desire of Ages 234. The words of the angel to Daniel relating to the last days were to be understood in the time of the end. What portion was to be understood in the time of the end? The whole book of Daniel? No, the part that had to do with the last days. At that time, she quotes Daniel 12 verse 4 again, at that time many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. The wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. So who are the wise ones? The wise ones are the ones that understand the 2300 day prophecy and the wicked ones are the ones that deny it. Manuscript releases, volume 1, page 99. The unsealing of the little book was the message in relation to time. <laughs> there it is, in black and white. She never was mistaken on this point. Now I'm going to skip the next quotation, and I'm going now to page 336. Let's discuss the iron and the clay. Yesterday we uh, had a question about this. Um, Ellen White has a very interesting explanation of the iron and the clay. Different than, uh, than any of our scholars that I know of ever present in evangelistic meetings. And you know, there's one characteristic, and I'll show this in the, in the next anchor class, if we're all still here. Uh, there's one characteristic that all of the Antichrist passages have. One common denominator. And that is a union of church and state. Every single one of the Antichrist prophecies, whether it be the, the man of sin, whether it be the harlot, whether it be the king of the north. You remember the king of the north that says, arms shall stand in his place. You know, those arms were going to help the king of the north whether it be the abomination of desolation, it doesn't matter which picture of the Antichrist you have in Scripture, you always have this common denominator of the church using the power of the state. And it is in Daniel 2 as well. Let me read this statement from Ellen White. Volume 4 of the Bible Commentary, 1168 and 1169. By the way, if I might make a parenthesis here, what would be more powerful a more powerful way of using Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. Would it be more powerful to speak about the, about the increase of modern technology or would it be more powerful to show people the prophecy of the 2300 days and how leading up to 1844 there was an intercontinental, interdenominational movement that preached this very message? Much more powerful in its context. Now, Ellen White speaks about the iron and the clay. The iron and the clay represent the mingling of churchcraft and statecraft. This union is weakening all the power of the churches. This investing the church with the power of the state will bring evil results. Men have almost passed the point of God's forbearance. They have invested their strength in what? 
in politics and have united with the papacy. But the time will come when God will punish those who have made void His law, and their wo evil work will recoil upon themselves. I'll tell you, I've never heard an evangelist of the Seventh-day Adventist Church use this interpretation of Daniel 2. Interesting, why not? Well, because you really can't prove biblically that the iron and the clay represent church and state, right? Wrong. Let me ask you, how do you suppose we should determine what is represented by the iron and the clay? How do, how do we find out? Because Ellen White said so. So when you're giving a Bible study, you say, Ellen White says. No. You go to the Bible first and say, oh, by the way, Ellen White also said that. You know, if you show Ellen White is right enough times, people start, it'll start uh, dawning on them that maybe this lady had supernatural wisdom. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to show, she's right on this, she's right on this, she's right on this, she's right on this. Uh, 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 you do that enough times, people say, well, maybe she's right about other things too. Now, I'm going to go through this quickly. Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. We're going to talk about the potter's clay. Should we, should we look up potter's clay in Scripture? Of course. Because Daniel chapter 2 speaks of potter's clay. Let me ask you, is Daniel 2 dealing with symbols? Yes. Is the gold a symbol? Yes. Is the silver a symbol? Yes. Is the bronze a symbol? Is the iron a symbol? Yes. Is the mountain a symbol? Yes. Is the rock a symbol? Yes. But the clay isn't. You see the inconsistency? I'm being sarcastic, by the way. <laughs> the clay must also be symbolic of something. So we have to look in other places of Scripture what the clay symbolizes. Is that, the, is that the biblical norm? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. The Holy Spirit placed in Scripture everything we need to understand Scripture. You don't need commentaries. You don't need scholars. I'm not saying that it's bad to have scholars. There are many good scholars. I'm not saying that commentaries are bad. What I'm saying is that if you didn't have scholars or commentaries, you could still make sense of Scripture by comparing one text with another. Sola Scriptura. No external source is absolutely indispensable to explain Scripture. Scripture explains itself from within. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. That's the key word in Daniel 2. And there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house. And there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of what? Oh, there's another key word that we find in Daniel 2. Two key words. Potter's and clay. And so it says, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Let me explain what that means. Jeremiah wrote right before the Babylonian captivity. And we're going to find that the vessel that the potter made is the formation of the nation of Israel. The breaking of the vessel is the captivity. And we're going to find that after the vessel is broken, God makes it again. He restores them after the captivity. Now notice what it says. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Now notice, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? So what does the, what does the clay represent here? It represents Israel. God's Old Testament church, God's people. And so it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So what does the potter's clay represent? It represents God's Old Testament church. It represents God's people. Are you following me? 
Now, there's another couple of ways that we can approach this. And uh, I'll do this very quickly because there's one other thing that I want us to come to before we bring this to an end. There's much more that I hope that you'll read in here uh, in the syllabus, other examples that I provide. Uh, let's take, for example, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. That's speaking about the literal creation of the body of man and giving him the literal breath of life. It says, the Lord God formed man, formed as a potter. Isaiah 64, verse 8 says that God, God was a potter who, you, who took the clay to make us literally. So it says, the Lord God made man or formed man out of the dust of the ground. It was wet dust, by the way. It was clay. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now you say, what possible relationship could that have with uh, the issue of the clay in Daniel chapter 2? Well, just let's reflect and think for a moment. Man was composed, the body of man was composed literally of clay. Did the body have many different members? Did the body function if it didn't have the spirit or the breath? No. The breath is given to the body, and every part of the body begins to function. Now let me ask you, symbolically speaking, because we're dealing with symbols here in Daniel 2, symbolically, symbolically what is the body of Christ? The church. What needed to happen with the church in order for each part of the body to function? The Spirit had to enter on the day of Pentecost. And then when the Spirit entered, every part of the body begins to function and to work. So the physical clay that the body of man was formed out of represents the spiritual body, the church. And the physical breath that entered the body represents the spiritual breath that enters on the day of Pentecost. So once again, the clay, symbolically speaking, represents what? It represents the church. Are you with me? So was Ellen White right when she spoke about churchcraft and statecraft? Of course, we know that the state portion would be the iron because that's the iron monarchy of Rome. That's the state portion. So the clay must represent the church. Let's go now to page 338. Ellen White states that the Garden of Eden was like a little piece of heaven on earth. <laughs> Where in the Bible would you ever find that idea? Ezekiel 28 verse 13 has the answer. It's speaking about Lucifer before his sin when he was in heaven. Notice what it says about him. You were in Eden, the garden of God. So where was the garden before? Where was the garden before? On earth? It's not talking about earth, talking about heaven. When he's perfect, you, look, you read it. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. So where was Lucifer? In Eden, the garden of God. But was the garden of Eden on earth? Does Genesis say that the garden of Eden was on earth? Of course it does. Where were Adam and Eve placed? In Eden. <laughs> so Eden was a little piece of heaven on earth. Let's read some interesting statements. Volume 1 of the Bible Commentary, page 1082. Adam had themes for contemplation in the works of God in Eden, which was heaven in miniature. Volume 3 of Spiritual Gifts, 83 and 84. As his feet touch the mountain, it's, it parts asunder and becomes a very great plain. This is the second coming. And is prepared for the reception of the holy city in which is the paradise of God, the garden of Eden, which was taken up after man's transgression. Now it descends with the city, more beautiful and gloriously adorned, 
than when removed from the earth. Uh, would it be true for would it be true to say that the, the Garden of Eden was removed from the earth before the flood? Yes. It was a little piece of heaven on earth. It wasn't like the rest because guardians were placed at the gate. See what Ellen White says makes perfect sense. And it's biblical in the light of Ezekiel 28 and verse 13. Let's go to the bottom of page 339. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture here? Don't pass up the details that Ellen White uses. They're amazing. And then go to the Bible and try and find them. Ellen White stated that serpents could fly. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on earth. It had wings. And while flying through the air, presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. You say, no, that's preposterous. Where do you find that in the Bible? Well, first of all, allow me to say that in the artwork of, artwork of antiquity, in inscriptions, in archaeological excavations, Quite frequently, serpents are depicted with wings. It is clear that in the minds of the ancients, there was still a remnant of the original character of the serpent. Why would they paint serpents with wings? Even Hollywood these days has movies <laughs> where serpents have wings. Genesis 3, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, here, here's the biblical evidence. Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. If the serpent was doing that before, that would have been no punishment. <laughs> so he was not dragging himself along the ground before. So by inference, it's very logical to say that the serpent wasn't eating dust. The serpent was flying. Incidentally, Isaiah 14, verse 29 says, Do not rejoice, all you of, of Philistia, because the, Lord, the rod that struck you is broken, for out of the serpent's roots will come forth a viper, and its offspring will be a fiery flying serpent. <laughs> was Ellen White right? Ellen White says that God had warned Adam and Eve that a powerful angel had fallen from heaven. Where does the Bible say that? Well, let's read Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made and said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So who was it that came to tempt Eve? A serpent. Who was really speaking? It was the devil. It's like Balaam's donkey. It was not the donkey that was speaking. Balaam thought so. And he was so angry. You know, if a donkey talked to me, I'll be out of there. <laughs> but he was so mad that when the donkey says, why are you beating me up? He says, I ought to kill you. It wasn't the donkey that was speaking. The angel of the Lord was standing in front of the donkey and was doing the talking. An angel was talking. In Genesis, we find also an angel, a fallen angel talking. How do we know that God had warned Adam and Eve? Listen, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 52. Our first parents were not left without a warning of the danger that threatened them. Heavenly messengers opened to them the history of Satan's fall and its plots for their destruction, unfolding more fully the nature of the divine government which the prince of evil was trying to overthrow. Why didn't the devil appear as an angel? Why did he feel like he had to hide himself behind a serpent? Because it would have been too obvious. Because so we have evidence that God had warned them because the devil had to use a devious method. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. 
Had she been addressed by, by, being, by a being like the angels, her fears would have been excited. But she had no thought that the fascinating serpent could become the medium of the fallen foe. <laughs> so the devil says, she's expecting an angel. I'm not coming there as an angel. Makes perfect sense. Was Adam with Eve when she was tempted? <laughs> Ellen White says yes. Notice the last paragraph. The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occupied in the daily labor in the garden. With him she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone, but absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from his side. They were not together. So people say Ellen White was wrong. Genesis 3 verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. See, that's the verse that's used. Uh, the, uh, he, was, he was with her. So how can Ellen White say that they were separated? Well, that we need to understand what is meant by the expression with her. Does it mean that it was going to be with her 24-7, uh, 365? No, the explanation is given in Genesis 3 verse 12. Same expression. Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Is Adam saying the woman that you gave me to be with me every single second of my existence? No. So, so when Ellen White says that uh, Adam and Eve were not together, in the light of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12, we know that it doesn't mean uh, the way people say that it means that Adam and Eve were together at that time and that Ellen White was wrong. God created Adam and Eve to be together, but it doesn't mean that they were going to be together 24-7, 365. God simply created Eve to be with Adam. Is that clear? So these are examples. In the next material here, beginning on page 343, you have something that was written by Douglas Waterhouse. He was my teacher in college at Andrews University. He should have been a teacher in the seminary. Never was. Phenomenal teacher. You'll find many more examples of how Ellen White is in perfect harmony with Scripture on so many details. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary-level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.